Hello, you gorgeous human being. You are going to love this conversation with Henneke, who is founder of the School of Sensual Arts and author of the brand new book, Sensual. She is one of my Hay House sisters and has the most gorgeous energy about her. In this conversation, we are diving deep into what it means to live a sensual life and what it means to be able to tap into that feeling of aliveness. We talk about the difference between sexuality and sensuality, why so many of us feel cut off and what are some of the tools, techniques and practices that you can start adhering to in your lives now in order to create this really exquisite feeling of deep connection, deep belonging and intimacy with both yourself and the lives that we are living. I just love this conversation and I hope that you do too. So without any further ado, let's get on with the episode. Hello, 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 you gorgeous human being. It is Susie Ashworth here and you are listening to the Infinite Receiving Podcast. And I have got a juicy one for you today. I don't even know what it is, but I am really excited to have this conversation. I want to introduce you to one of my fellow Hay House sisters. Her name is Henneke. She is a Tantra expert and I'm really delighted to be having this conversation the day after her brand new book Sensual has been unleashed into uh, the universe. So uh, congratulations and welcome to the podcast, Henneke. Thank you so much for having me. So excited to be here and yes, it's all very fresh um, having released the, the book Sensual yesterday. So yeah, just excited to be sharing that with you in this moment. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, how sensual are you feeling today? I am feeling gooey inside. Mm. And for me, being sensual is being able to tap into the intuitive sensations that are happening within our bodies moment to moment and being able to sit with those sensations. So mm. there's definitely like middle of a brownie type goo sensation happening <laughs> inside my body today because this week has been filled with this kind of anticipation. And mm. yeah, it just feels like yesterday after the book launch, I kind of reached that, that inner gooiness um, mm -hmm. of releasing uh, this work after several years of kind of putting it together and researching it's nice to meet that center so yeah that's how I'm feeling sensual in my body today I love that explanation of being able to tap into it moment by moment and I am curious how frequently throughout the day are you checking in with how is it that I'm feeling and then depending on what is present for you, how does that then change what it is that you're doing or at least inform what it is that you are doing? At the beginning for me, it was writing in a journal before I went to sleep. That was when I started, I suppose, this practice of actually checking in with how I'm feeling. Um, and then through my Tantra Yoga practice, my, my practice that I do, that has become a bit more of a frequent kind of checking in um, because what we do on the mat is moment to moment after we do a posture we check in with how that posture has affected our bodies so it could be then um, you know sitting on the tube in an idle moment and just having that check in or it could be if I feel like I'm in the throes of a, a big emotion checking in and seeing where that's landing in my body or if I feel quite relaxed then it's also checking in with that and I think being able to discern when it's happening and how I'm responding to it is mm. when you take sensual into being a practice um, because I could feel stressed and then take that out on a pack of cookies <laughs> or I could feel stressed and do something that feels uh, nourishing and restorative and regulating 
um, for my body. Not saying that eating a pack of cookies isn't regulating. That is needed sometimes mm. too. But um, yeah, just checking in and being able to respond to the situations rather than react to the sensations within our bodies. You gave the definition of sensual. Do you want to share that? Can you remember? Because you were saying actually in the book that there were lots of different definitions. And what did you land upon? I think when I was doing my research, I was coming across the way that sensual has been interpreted from the dictionary definition, which uh, throws together sensual with pleasure and gratification. And it also mm. the dictionary definition throws sensual together with particularly sexual gratification. And part of my work uh, at the School of Sensual Arts and also in this book is untangling our ability to be sensual with sex because whilst sex almost always involves an aspect of sensuality is a deeply sensual in your body process sensuality mm. does not always have to involve sex and I think that's one of the key reasons why so many of us feel blocked to accessing our sensuality because there is this fear that it uh, invokes sexuality which is another very repressed part of our society and psyche um, so yeah, I have this kind of untangling process. And for me, sensuality is living in the five senses and being able mm -hmm. to connect with the energy in the Tantra practice. It is called our Shakti, which translates mm -hmm. to from Sanskrit power, manifest power that is residing within our bodies, but also residing within all of nature, in the storms and the seas and the sunsets and in our anger and in our tears and in our joy. So Shakti is being able to connect to it all and sensuality mm. is being able to connect to it all. This I think is really important because the dictionary definition, like you said, often entangles it with gratification and pleasure of the senses. And when I read that, the first thing that I thought of is part of the reason that I would push that away is because that is self-indulgent. And even though I don't really resonate with being religious, I know that the monks, the nuns, what is held up as good and positive is often that pious nature. And actually we should be... I don't think that we would use the word repressing, but certainly denying of the senses is almost seemed as being closer to God. So I'm curious whether you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's across a lot of kind of mainstream religions that there's this relinquishing of uh, that the life of a householder, right? The life of working and um, eating and sleeping and drinking and all of this, there's this common kind of relinquishment when you go into a spiritual path that that is for regular householder people and this is the spiritual path. And what the tantric practice does, which is um, from my lineage, I'm a first generation British Indian woman. So I was raised with kind of orthodox Hinduism, which also has this kind of relinquishing monkhood, type disintegration, I suppose, or dissecting of the way that this is spiritual and that isn't. So when I started my tantric journey and really started going deeper into the philosophy, the really beautiful thing about tantra is that it's not a religion, it's a life path, it's a, a philosophy, it's a practice, it's a lifestyle. And what it says is that spirituality and living are not two separate things. Mm. Spirit is to be found in the everyday moment. So it creates this path for the everyday householder to find spirit in, in each moment that we have. So if we bring that to our senses, it's, you know, how we listen, it's how we see, it's how we smell, it's how we taste, how we touch. And I love that because it means that life itself can become the prayer. There doesn't need to be this kind of withdrawal from life because I feel like when we're in life, that's when our spirit is truly tested. It's very easy to find godliness and love and consciousness when we're sitting in a cave in the Himalayas yeah <laughs> we don't have all of the triggers around us but when we are in the throes of 
traffic in London at 5 p.m. on a Friday night or <laughs> when we're at home during a festival with all of our family and our siblings and yeah. when we're at work and we're trying to get our message across or we're not being heard, that's when our spirit is really tested. And mm -hmm. I feel like this path which offers us ways in which we can stay connected to life, be in and of it, and at the mm -hmm. same time um, offer us consciousness and awareness of how to navigate that uh, that is this path, that is the path of sensual, that is the path of Tantra. Let's talk about the traffic jam. This was literally my experience this morning. I thought I'm leaving the house in plenty of time to get the girls to school. And then it was just blockage after blockage after blockage. How do we practice? Like, what is the practice in those moments where you are able to recognize that this also gets to be pathways to divinity or this is not even the pathway this is divinity so I suppose first question is, is is it the pathway or is it divinity and then what is the practice in those moments yeah it is the divinity because the beautiful thing about this path is that it doesn't say that any emotion or anything is good or bad it simply mm. is so it's a practice for reality as it is so even our anger, even our frustration is divinity expressing itself exactly as it wants to express itself. And so I suppose in that moment, you know, if we look at the ancient tantric text, the Vigyan Bhairav Tantra, uh, it gives 112 different types of meditations, which we can connect to. And the first okay. nine of those practices are breath practices. Then there are sets of practices around the senses. So there are all these very kind of moment to moment practices that can really draw us back into uh, experiencing that moment exactly as it is, rather than saying, this is bad, I shouldn't be reacting. Um, I can't believe I've I've expressed this way in front of my children. I can't believe I just yeah. shouted at that person, but actually being with like, I'm sitting with this now, I'm seeing it arising, accepting that it's here. And when we come into, I feel this path of acceptance, there is this real dissolving of the good and the bad around it mm. and simply kind of being with it dissolves the, the high frequency um, energy that frustration and anger that can really hold in our bodies. I think that's that's how we, we can kind of distinguish it and work with it. Yeah, I really love that. What I hear is the practice is radical acceptance. And in uh, the moment that we choose radical acceptance, we are able to feel as opposed to be in resistance to what is. And then in the feeling, what I am sensing is that it is the observation. Can I just be in allowance of this? I wonder where love comes into those moments. Is there a place for love? Is love needed in that moment of frustration? Or is radical acceptance, is that love? Yeah, I think radical acceptance is love because I feel like when we try to love that moment, I feel like they're two separate emotions, you know, there is mm -hmm. trying to shift anger into love and mm -hmm. let anger be anger, let it have its yeah. space, let it have its moment, let it have its naturally arising sensation that occurs in the body, let it connect you back to that part of yourself that is raging and wild and expressing because so often in society we are not allowed to express mm. these really human parts of existence so I feel like yeah. radical acceptance and consciousness or awareness of course that's going to lead us deeper into love but mm. uh, I think switching being like I should love this emotion that's mm. that's quite a different frequency <laughs> so I love yeah I think I like I prefer the word say radical acceptance and compassion or awareness because it's neutral there's such neutrality in which to absorb that sensation yeah can you explain to us a little bit more about what tantra yoga is yeah absolutely so yoga is a lot more known and understood um, already in the West. It's this path of union. 
And Tantra is the sister science of the yogic practice. So sometimes yoga is called the father of the Eastern spiritual practices and Tantra is called the mother. And yoga is the path of discipline and Tantra is the path of acceptance. So there's kind of this warrior and mother energy that that resides in both. So bringing that together, it's bringing Mm. together the discipline with the love and with the acceptance. And that's, uh, you know, that's not just in Tantra Yoga, it's not just our physical practice, but it's Mm. also our understanding of what the philosophy is trying to share with us um, around accepting reality as it is so that we have these tools that can accompany us off the mat as well. So if you come to a Tantra Yoga class, it will look very, very similar to a normal yoga class. There's a little bit more work with the energetic system because we're really trying to understand um, how energy moves through our body and our energy is also of course our emotion so once we start to understand our energy we start to understand our emotions a lot more as well and we're able to kind of regulate our emotions and and be with them so I'd say that's kind of uh, a little bit of a difference you might find a bit more energetic work in in a tantra yoga class how often do you practice so my physical asana practice is I'd say two times a week That's when I actually physically step on the mat. But the way that I think, the way that I hold thoughts in my mind, I feel like that is a a lifestyle, right? So that's all of the other 23 hours that I'm not on the mat. Um, Yeah. I'm curious about your experience of actually writing the book and how you felt in the writing process. Yeah. Oh, this is a great question, Um, especially being on this side of it now. Somebody once described the writing process to me kind of like childbirth, and I've not yet birthed children, so maybe you can help me with whether this is true or not. But it says that birthing a book is similar to the childbirth process because you you're writing and there's a lot of there's contractions there's expansions there's growing pains there's labor (laughs) there's love there's this emerging of yourself into this author mother um and then after that kind of process finishes and uh you know in childbirth oxytocin is released and um you kind of forget how hard that process actually was because you have this beautiful shiny baby (laughs) of a book and I feel like that's you know that's where I'm coming to right now but I'm still just emerging from that so I'm still remembering a lot of the darkness that appeared when you're sitting in front of a blank page with a blinking cursor. And yeah. the first thing, I feel like I wrote the book three times. Um, okay. The first time was a deeply therapeutic process where what was coming onto the page was uh, a lot of my own shadows, a lot of my own reasons for how I came to this work, a lot of mm-hmm. grief um, and a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of healing happened for me in that journey. The second part was adding the philosophy, the mythology, the practices, the psychology Mm -hmm. uh, to support the story. And then the third time was bringing it for the reader and really unifying both story that is relatable and applicable to the lives that we live in Western society and bringing that together with Eastern spiritual traditions, Mm -hmm. frameworks, philosophies and psychology as well. So, yeah, there was kind of this three-part process that really drew out, I think, different parts of me as a a human, as a woman, as an individual, as an Indian writer, as a British writer, and kind of this bridge that that drew across all of those three stages to to the final final products that is, yeah, the book. (laughs) So it wasn't easy, (laughs) but, um, yeah, it was an important process. How did you feel in your process? <laughs> oh my God. I mean, it was really bloody hard because like you probably identify, I'm sharing in this dual place. So for me, at least the duality is as I'm teaching you this, but also I am a student of this. And actually, if we look at mastery as a mountain, I don't even feel like I'm halfway up the mountain. I'm still like in my beginning stages. And so uh, there's that imposter syndrome and also like, no, look at the life that you have created and all of the lessons that you've learned and everything that you desire to share. 
And because my book is about is knowing your greatness, it's creating magic. It's like the polarity of that is me and my smallness, like writing the book. So it's a very meta experience of me having to move through all of the reasons, all of the stories, all of the limiting beliefs that say, no, you're not ready for this and really honor the the transmission that needed to come through. So it was it was very challenging. And I'm not sure if I have a different experience with books since writing my own. But the reason I wanted to know how it felt for you is because as a reader, and I haven't finished reading your book, but I feel like it's one of those books that I will come back to again and again and again as my own tantra practice deepens as a reader like the opening pages the introduction what happened to me physically was like my body sighed it was like ah, oh. and so the energy of the words that you have put together is is a really soft it's like a really just like somebody's breathing in. It's like, okay, time to pause, time to relax, mm -hmm. time to like, you can feel your healing in the words, healing me as the reader. So uh, it, was, it was really quite profound. And I feel like maybe just generally my senses are heightened after having written my own book so I can feel the energies of books in a different way. But it really really pronounced with your book just how much it's like it's tender is the the energy of your book it's really beautiful thank you I feel tender hearing your reflections on it because it's a one-way process until it lands in the hearts and the hands of the people that are receiving it and I think this is one of the first times that I have heard verbally someone receive it in that way and so that's really really mm. tender for me to hear and makes me feel a bit teary actually <laughs> yeah thank you so much thank you so so much and um yeah there was so much healing that happened for me during the writing of it yeah. and I, I really really empathize and really connect to that feeling of being the student of this practice first and foremost and always and I felt like the more that I was researching the book the less that I felt like I knew yeah. <laughs> continuously <laughs> in this loop. <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess there's more more the portals and doors are opening. So, and I read, when I was in the throes of my imposter syndrome, as I think comes up for a lot of writers <laughs> when we're embarking on our first book, Babies, um, I read this line that said, you don't need to be an expert to write the book. Writing the book makes you the expert and embodying mm. the book makes you the expert. And absolutely no one can invalidate the experiences that you have had that have led you to write the book um yeah. that is an embodied experience and yeah. we're writing from that place of of deep feeling the transformation um yeah. and the potential of the words that we're writing so yeah I sigh as I hear myself saying that back because it's definitely not been easy to come to that <laughs> yeah yeah and in uh, our darkest moments, you have to keep coming back to it, keep coming back to the remembering and the knowing. So last year, I studied a Tantra program with one of our mutual friends, Layla Martin. And I would say that that experience has been quite life changing for me. And the reason that I went down that route is because... I felt so shut down. And actually, for me, it was very much, I would say that the last three years, and probably I'm coming out of this phase, like the, this chapter of this phase, although the discovery will be a lifetime or the exploration will be a lifetime. But I kind of called maybe 2021 to 2023 my exploration journey. And there was a real desire to open myself up because I felt completely shut down. I was worried that I was never going to have like 
an orgasm again. I just thought like, what is wrong with me? And I know that for your journey, that se sensual, you call it sensual numbness, actually. And this was also interesting to me because every time I saw the word sensual, I wanted to be like sexual. <laughs> I could like interchange the sensual with the sexual. But I know that the sexuality piece was your gateway into this journey. And I suppose I wanted to clarify was that your gateway into Tantra or did were you aware of Tantra before you being like, OK, I need to work things out here? Yeah. So for me, it was a real returning because I suppose I was already in the yogic path. So I was already mm -hmm. teaching in the yogic path. And when the sexuality realization came in that I was absolutely numb in my pelvis, which is a real alarming state and feeling that hopelessness of am I ever mm. going to feel that aliveness within me again like where did mm. I go where did she go is she coming back am I going to feel like this forever because it can really feel like forever <laughs> when it's yeah. happening um yeah. and that kind of led me on this path first to learn the tools to turn my own body back online that's really where this all began and as I was on that pathway to discovering those tools I started to come into contact with rituals, words, festivals, uh, I mean, traditional festivals um, that I was experiencing as a child in mm. my uh, lineage, you know, in my Indian lineage. And I started to draw a bridge between the rituals of my indigenous ancestry and the tools that my body was needing at the time. So there was this real returning actually to Tantra, though that's not what you know, it, that's not what we called it growing up. It was just what yeah. we did. You know, we have, we celebrated these festivals of the goddesses. We gathered for nine nights every year to celebrate and do this dance called Garba, which means womb to really invoke beautiful mm. energy within the body to nourish us for the next season, to celebrate the divine feminine. Like all of this was already there, but I didn't mm. realize that this was called Tantra when I was a child growing up. And so yeah, there was this 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 returning to, I would say, and this realizing that this was already all there. So yeah, it's a, a a really beautiful realization. I really resonate with that. Whilst my life has not been about the ritual, I think that one of the most empowering things about learning on this tantra program is that there were so many messages that reinforced what i intuitively knew intuitively knew about the body intuitively knew about the breath and intuitively knew about myself you say it in the book and you just said it here like where did my aliveness go and i am curious about when do you think that it disappeared i, I don't know whether you can answer what like, when was the last time you felt alive when you're kind of having this realization of like where did I go what where does your mind take you back to so it takes you back to being a child and really mm. being in this very energized like dancing by myself in a room leaping being in nature like just being here in this body and I experienced mm. a series of griefs between the ages of 10 to 14, which were so painful, but I didn't really know what to do when you're a kid and a teenager. It's like, I don't know. So I just went to live in my head, basically. So I think from, yeah, from, from my teenage years onwards, then I was operating from my eyebrows upwards and I studied law in English and in French and really did this mastery of the mind and completely yeah. disconnected from my body because of the pain, because of the fear, because of the grief that I didn't know how to survive. And that's what I first came into contact with then when I started that journey, all of those unfelt feelings. And sensuality, when we're searching for our aliveness, Something that I often share with people who come through the School of Sensual Arts is when we're opening the door to more pleasure in our lives, we open the door to feel everything more deeply because our body can't yes. choose to only open the door of pleasure. 
<laughs> it's going to go, okay, the capacity for feeling is growing. So we're going to feel our pain more. We're going to feel our grief more. We're going to feel our sadness more. We're going to feel our anger more. And we're also going to feel our pleasure more. So it's becoming more alive in all aspects of, of our humanness. And oh my God, I say exactly the same thing at the start of Infinite Receiving. I'm like, this is not a path for the faint-hearted. Like, if you want to receive yeah. infinitely, you're going to receive infinitely. And it's about having the tools that will enable you to respond to the challenges and those situations that require resilience. You're going to have those tools, but don't expect it to all be rainbows and sunflowers because feeling more experiencing more receiving more it's all of it so I really resonate with that and I also really resonate with when we have these hard times in childhood we go into protective mode and for at least me personally protecting my heart meant shutting you know shielding my heart and so much of our feeling comes through the heart space. And so if it doesn't feel safe, you want to keep your heart protected, then you're going to shut yourself down. But what is also interesting for me is I had my astrology done and my uh, something about Mercury, which makes me very heady. And then my moon is in Gemini. And what the astrologer said is that means that you have to not just intellectually understand your feelings, but you have to feel your feelings. And when he said this to me, I felt so emotional because I was like, oh my God, that's what the journey has been for me since the beginning of 2020. You know, since really opening the door to Tantra, it's like, I intellectually understand, I'm pissed off, I'm angry. I have not been feeling my feelings. And so it's been liberating to uh, one hear, like, there's nothing wrong with you, actually, because that's the big fear when you're shutting, when you feel shut down and you don't know how to access what it is that you want to access. Feeling like I'm weird, feeling like there's something wrong. It's like, no, also this is in your makeup and... There were tools for you to play with as well. So I suppose we share all of this because there are so many women, particularly come to my stage of life, you're in your 40s and it's like there is something that is not quite right. I've been living my life. I've been doing the mum thing. I've been doing the business thing. There is something that feels dull. What the fuck is up? What do you want to say to those women? What I want to say to those women is that if we see our sensuality, our sexuality as a season, just like the rest of the world has seasons, you know, winter, spring, summer, autumn, then it takes a lot of pressure off chasing mm. a type of sensuality that we experienced in our previous years, our younger years. And it allows us to move with sensuality in the cycle that we're in. And that mm. might look different to how it looked in a previous season. And it's only us humans that have kind of set upon ourselves to appear or present ourselves the same way every single day of the year when everything around us, the sun rises and falls, the moon changes every 30 days, 28 days, and it's only us humans that seem to think that we are not part of this cycle when we are. We're part of a monthly cycle. We're part of a, a daily cycle. We're also part of a life cycle in which mm. our sensuality will change. So I think in this new season that we find ourselves in, when we've had children, when we haven't had children, when we're in our 40s, it's about finding the sensuality that our body needs in this moment. And that might be fiercer and stronger, or that might be softer and in surrender. And it's about tuning in to that now. What is my sensuality in this cycle? And that will be the way that we stop chasing something from the past and the way that we mm. bring it into this really empowering sensuality in the present. 
Um, so yeah, follow our seasons of sensuality is what I would say. I love that. In the book, you talk about there's kind of five different phases of activating your sensuality. Can you talk us through each of those phases? Yeah, absolutely. So I start this as a kind of framework and it's not a linear framework in terms of a step-by-step process. We might oscillate between different phases at different stages of our lives and it starts with sensual innocence. So this is around, you know, when we're a kid and we're just learning how to understand the world and the first way we do that before we are even cognizant of communication through words is through our senses Mm. you know our caregivers um, and repeated things that happen through our senses for example in the book I say you jump in a puddle and someone says oh you're all wet now you have a context for what wet is right so that's sensual innocence and it's that stage of also you know, as children, when we're discovering different parts of our bodies and we don't know that our genitals are different, have a different connotation to our nose, except for when society gives us a different mm. connotation. So there's a deep innocence with yeah. discovering our bodies. And that is just for, you know, for us to enjoy and explore and be innocent, deeply innocent with. And we can return to that innocence, even as adults, when we release a lot of the shame that we have picked up from society around our bodies and our sexuality. So then we move into this period of kind of sensual exploration and this could be, you know, in teenage years or this could be later in life as well, you know, after divorce or after a different life-changing event or just at any point really where we move into a stage of sensual exploration. So in teenage years, we might have a flash of hormones that appear in the body that mean that you know we start to be attracted to certain people or things that we weren't attracted to before and we start to feel this flurry in our bodies and we start to discern what we like and we don't like and this is really our our period of of exploration we might go through periods of exploration at different stages of our lives so then we move into this period of sensual I think it's expansion isn't it so this idea of So you've explored what you like, you've explored what you don't like, and you feel like there must be something more. Like, what what is that? What is that? And so the stages kind of move into now this path of moving our our sensuality, our sexuality into something that is a self-discovery practice. So it's not just this piece of underwear that we put on for others, but it's Mm. this way of knowing ourselves and our spirits more deeply. And that's what leads us into sensual wisdom. That's where we take sensuality as this spiritual path that connects us to our souls, our our deep spirit. Um, So yeah, that's kind of the the framework, I suppose, that that expansion and that that playing with that we sometimes return into that innocence and sometimes we're in our wisdom with it as well. And sometimes we realize we don't know anything (laughs) and we return to exploration. Um, as we explore different parts of our sensual and sexual selves. Yeah. Do you see those phases as separate from the cyclical nature of being? And I'm thinking about this like on a day-to-day basis. I get it from like a the, the 28-day cycle or even phases of life. But I thought it was interesting when you said, like, even our days are cyclical. We, we start the day, we end the day, we have the middle of the day. How does that work when it comes to our sensuality or indeed the phases? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where Tantra and yoga meet its third sister science, Ayurveda, which means this, the science of life. And it's an ancient medicinal healing system um, that really works with nature. And it says that the day is composed of three doshas, like three different, you could say, constitutions. And so the day has different types of availability to us, availability in the way of energy to us. So, for example, in India, uh, a lot of spiritual self-development, yogic practices happen in the very early hours because that's the vata Hmm. time of day. That's where we're kind of airy and light and there's a lot of oxygen in in the world and everything's a little bit quieter and that's where our, we can really sense our energy more deeply in the morning. Then we move into, you know, when the sun rises and uh, it becomes a bitter time of day and this is when 
fire activates within the body. This is why they say eat your meal, your heaviest meal in the middle of the day because your digestive fire is also the biggest, mm. right? The the grandest. This is when it's it's best to eat. And then we have the kapha time of day. So this is the earth element. So this is this period for relaxation and mm. um, calming down and, of course, sleeping as well. So we kind of view this framework of the day and start to kind of map our the things that we do to this naturally occurring cycle that has been, been given to us from people who have studied this for thousands of years we start to sink into that that beautiful cycle and we all know what it's like when we try to eat at three in the morning how that feels in our body it's <laughs> yeah it's not in our natural cycle right and I think when it comes to our sensuality and our sexuality and our sexual energy as well we can begin to map okay well when in the day do I feel most connected to that? You know, mm. and instead of chasing it, oh, it has to be at night um, when we're in the covers. <laughs> Maybe for you, sensuality appears first thing in the morning when the dawn has broke and the day is new. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just coming back to discovering that and breaking the mold, break the mold of, you know, when you think it should be and discover in your cycle of the day, when is this available to you? Mm. How much of your work is dedicated to the sexuality side of sensuality versus sensuality on its own? I have a bridge of, of both sexuality and sensuality because, of course, mm -hmm. they're, they're two sides of, of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And Tantra in itself, as a traditional practice, didn't really involve sexual practices, traditional Tantra, that is. They were reserved for the practitioners that had done a lot a lot a lot of work in understanding the energy and then with a teacher who says okay now take this period of time and explore um maituna which is the sexual practices and this is in one school of the 64 different schools of tantra right this is a very very small part of the traditional tantra practice but mm -hmm. as tantra has moved into the modern day now we see neo tantra and this yeah. is where the sexual practices have come in uh, this is a new wave of Tantra that has developed very, very recently. And I like to keep up with the way that Tantra has morphed because Tantra, in its like etymological meaning, it means a technique to expand. So it, it mm. essentially is a technology and it evolves with time. It evolves with the time that it is in. And if today our sexuality is one of the deepest repressions that we have in society, then it's going to provide us a technology and techniques in which we can work with that. So I have this bridge between offering traditional Tantra that allows us to connect with the sexual energy within our bodies, our own bodies. And then I also have new Tantra practices. For example, you can come and do a Tantric date night online with a partner and discover that for yourself, learn new tools and techniques in which you can um, expand in your sexual aliveness. Um, with yourself or with your partner so I have a, a a dual I say a dual approach do you feel that the more liberated a person becomes in their sexuality it's inevitable that they become more liberated in their general sensuality yeah I think it's it maybe it's a chicken and an egg kind of argument mm -hmm. whichever way it happens um they're both going to have an impact on each other of course if you start to become more aware of your sensations and your senses moment to moment when you apply that into a sexual context your experience of sex is going to radically change and expand because instead of being stuck in your mind or doing what you think you should be doing you're in your body you're in your senses you're in your sensations and then vice versa, as you start to activate the sexual energy within your body, you're going to start to clear a lot of blocks in your body mm -hmm. because it doesn't take someone who studied it for a couple of years or even thousands of years to understand that our sexual energy is one of the most powerful energies within our body, right? It's enough to create life. And mm -hmm. if we're not planning on creating life all the time, then Tantra has given us these ways in which we can cultivate and use that energy to um, to expand our, our life force, to expand our awareness, to heal our organs, to um, nourish our bodies, to clear blocks and repressions. So, 
Yeah, I think whichever way, whichever route you take, whichever route calls to you most, um, it's going to have an, an effect, vice versa, whichever way. As we're talking, I am outside of the kind of meet the fuckers, I'm a sexual um, therapist type vibe. The image that is coming to my mind is one of the uh, kind of and I don't want to say tantric coaches, but certainly sexual coaches where it almost like they're tasting life. <laughs> you know what, you know what I mean? Everything's yeah. very audible. And that can almost be intimidating, I think, for people who are just stepping out onto this path. It's not an overactivation, but I think for people who have been completely closed down, it feels weird. And a little bit scary. And it's a little bit like, oh, I'm not sure that I want to be tasting life in the way that, that that person is tasting life all of the time. What do you say to that and that apprehension? Yeah, I think that it's important to remember that that's the way that those practices have manifested for that person. And that doesn't necessarily mm. mean that that's the way that they're going to manifest for you. You know, they're going to touch different aspects of your psyche and your being and your body. And I think sounding, yeah, you hear a lot of sounding when you go to tantra workshops, <laughs> depending on where they are and, you know, who's leading them. And that can definitely be uh, a little bit jarring, a little bit like, why are they making all these noises? And yeah. if we think of, again, bringing this context back to childbirth and the, the roaring, quite guttural sounds that come you can't stop those sounds from mm. coming, right? When you're trying to literally push something out of your body. And there's this real connection between the pelvic floor, the yoni and the throat and the yeah. jaw and the anatomy of the jaw and the pelvis. Yes. So the reason why sounding is really, really helpful is because as we start to open our mouths, as we start to open yeah. our voices, our throats, our jaws, where we hold so much tension, we start to open also that reflection, that mirror in our pelvis and our pelvic mm. floor and our yoni. So that's sort of where this correlation of like, don't hold it back. Don't, don't worry about what it sounds like. Don't worry about what it looks yeah. like. Just express, just use this space to express. Um, and so that's why we sometimes come into contact with these quite unusual sounding. <laughs> yeah. Um, these unusual sounding things when we come into certain workshops. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose the other thing is, is that, again, that's the judgment and there's the opportunity to notice your discomfort. Where is the gift? Where is the opportunity for radical acceptance in this moment? Why do I feel so uncomfortable with somebody, not even me, but somebody else expressing themselves the way that they desire to express when there is no harm being done to me or anybody else around what does it mean for me to give myself permission to express in whatever way my body desires? What is your vision? Like if you could wave a magic wand and I've referenced women quite a lot in this, well, and maybe only women, but for humanity, when it comes to sensuality, what is your vision? What would you love to see? I would love to see men, women, all genders, uh, come back into this sense of relinquishing the thoughts of who we should be and how we should mm. feel and stepping more deeply into the body and the deep wisdom, intellect, intuition that has evolved over a significantly longer period than the development of our mind. And as much as there are schools for the mind and so much of our education is based on training the mind, now it's time to move from mind and being mindful and it's time mm. to move into our bodies and to attend schools for the heart and mm. to attend schools for our sensuality and our sexuality just because the way that we learn it doesn't only have to be for educational purposes, right? It, it can be for returning to our bodies. It can be for learning about our sexuality, just the same way that we learn about everything else that we want to learn about. So my deep dream, my deep wish is that 
yeah, there are more and more spaces for us to feel like we belong, like we can mm. explore this work together. What difference do you think that that will make to the world, having more people turned on to life and their own aliveness in that way? There is so, so much inspiration, creativity that comes from when you feel turned on to life. Like you are a beautiful version of yourself. And being turned on to life again doesn't only mean being in the happy stuff, but it means mm. being able to feel it all. And if we're able to share that, if we're able to um, feel that, then we're able to build deeper, more fulfilling, longer lasting connections with those around us. And our sense of belonging and community, studies have shown, are significantly uh, high, the highest factor to the longevity of our lives, i.e. if we feel a sense of belonging, mm. then we're going to live a lot longer. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful because we live in this world where we can feel so alone with our feelings. And yeah, we're going to live shorter lives if we hold that all in and that stress mm. compounds in our bodies. So yeah, long, long, happy, connected, intimate lives. Yay. Right, before I ask you to share where everybody can get the book and connect with more of your teachings, I have some questions, some quick fire questions I ask everybody who comes on to the podcast. And the first question is, what does infinite receiving mean to you, Henneke? Infinite receiving to me means allowing. The first word that comes to mind is allowing like downloading, letting something fully come through you. Yeah. Beautiful. Allowing. How good are you at allowing? I think I'm still and forever will be a student of that. <laughs> <laughs> Some moments like yesterday, I, when the book launched, I felt like I was allowing and just receiving all of that. And then some days I feel like, you know, layers can come around and I have to look through those again. So yeah. I think, um, yeah, being on this path is remembering that, like you said, we're forever students and teachers <laughs> of remembering and forgetting continually yeah. while we're on it. Yeah. So. 100%. Where in your life or who in your life could you allow to support you just a little bit more right now? I think I can allow my parents to support me a bit more. They're very, very supportive parents, but I feel like there's so many questions I could ask them from their experience of life. And yeah. they're such great resources, our parents of lived wisdom. Um, yeah. So I'm going to say my parents and my elders. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. What is your greatest attribute? My sensuality. <laughs> Because I've worked on it for so long. <laughs> yeah. Similar question. Where in your life could you allow, or who in your life could you allow to love you just a little bit more? Maybe someone that I've fallen out with in the past. <laughs> Maybe we could find a little bit more love and compassion for each other. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. And final question. What is one thing that you are consciously manifesting right now? I am consciously manifesting a really, really beautiful union. It would be a really, really beautiful wedding at the moment. So... Yeah, it's coming really? up later this year and I'm just really giving a lot of my thoughts, my intentions, my visions for how I want that to feel and that union for family and partnership. I that's love that. I'm, that's where I am at the moment. <laughs> I am very excited for you. I am sure that it will be stunning, your wedding in every way, shape and form. I would love for you to share where can people find the book? Where can people find more of your teachings and wisdom? It's schoolofcentralarts.co.uk. Um, that's where we have our online tantra yoga community. That's where we have our online tantric date nights for couples. 
Um, we also have a central education course, so you can self-paced learn all of the things we wish we learned in sex education but weren't taught. <laughs> um, and a lot of kind of online content there, but we also have in-person workshops in and around London, retreats in the UK and Europe. Um, and trainings coming in the next year. So Amazing. that's where we are there. And you can find me on Instagram, myth busting, tantra often. Um, and that's henica.x. Um, so yeah, you can find me there and you can buy the book Central um, at your local bookshop, uh, Waterstones, Amazon, wherever you're listening to in the world, Barnes and Nobles, wherever your bookshop is, hopefully you'll find a copy of Central there to begin your Central Revolution. Amazing. Thank you so much. I have loved this conversation deeply. And I know that anybody who is listening to this who feels called or nudged or knows somebody that would benefit from this beautiful activation and transmission that we have had from Henneke today, I invite you to share the podcast. I invite you to come into our DMs. Let us know what touched you, what made you feel just a little bit more alive today. We would deeply, deeply appreciate it. And don't forget to go and buy the book. I can assure you, you will not regret it. Thank you so much, Henneke. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you so much. And please remember that faith plus action equals miracles.